Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, first session of our seminar series for 2022 2023. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Mohade, and we'll talk about quantum gravity in the laboratory. Thank you very much for, for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm, I'm very glad I could make it. So, I mean, first of all, I, I'm going to have to apologize for my voice. I have some kind of laryngitis that's making me lose my voice. Uh, I took a COVID test, so I don't think it's that. Uh, so you may not want to come too close, so who knows. Um, anyway, so my voice seems to be holding up okay at the moment, but I have to speak a little bit slowly, and there are certainly some sounds that don't really don't come out quite right. So I apologize for that and just hope I get, get through it. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about some low energy experiments that people are talking about and indeed starting to try to um, build towards actually doing to show something about the quantum nature of gravity kind of literally in a laboratory, um, hopefully. Yeah. Sorry, could we get someone? Um, so there's a long manuscript, um, that, I mean, it's longer than an article, but it's on the archive, there's the archive number on the slides, um, and this manuscript is joint work that I've done with Niels Linneman and Mike Schneider, so I guess I usually give this sort of disclaimer that there was a lot of, it wasn't that we were all of one mind on this project, and we spent a year kind of going through through the various arguments and arguing with each other. And I think everything that's in the manuscript, you know, we all sign off on. Things I say today, <coughs> you'd have to ask them exactly whether they would agree with the ways I put them. So, uh, you know, that that's sort of how it goes. So I always like to put the slides online so people can download them and follow them along if they like. If they like to, so there's a bit.ly address, and I wrote it up here as well. Um, yeah, if you're watching from home in the bottom right corner, right hand corner, there's there's a bit.ly address, and if you want the slides, so you know you don't have to rely on me going back or showing you things. Um, please download them, and they're there. <coughs> okay, um, so without further ado. There's a sort of introductory slide, and then I'll give you the overview of the talk. And the introductory slide is, is going to talk a bit about uh, just the very idea of testing quantum gravity. You know, it's commonplace in the literature that it's very hard, if not impossible, to test quantum gravity. And you get these um, back of the envelope calculations that you do the part, you know, if you're going to do it by an accelerator, it would need to stretch you know, most of the way from the Earth, you know, it'd be like an astronomical unit order of magnitude big, and it's kind of ridiculous to um, even do that. But I think people have been quite good recently, you know, there's some real kind of caveats to that as people have started to sort of think about that. So right, I'm starting with this sort of customary notice. Um, but of course, well, insofar as quantum gravity is supposed to have general relativity, it's supposed to have quantum field theory as its limits, and then of course classical, you know, then single part, you know, many particle quantum mechanics and non-relativistic quantum mechanics and non-relativistic gravity. I mean, of course, those are actual predictions of the, the successful theories that, you know, have, you know, are tested. <clears throat> so in part, what we're interested is in novel predictions there are even novel predictions in a sense of quantum gravity. It depends exactly what you mean by quantum gravity. So um, David Wallace has talked a lot about this um, recently. If you think about quantum gravity just meaning systems where you have both quantum mechanics and gravity in play, that um, you know there are plenty of systems like that, including ones with really with kind of novel predictions. I would say sort of novel predictions. Um, so, you know, what do we exactly mean by quantum gravity? It makes sense actually to include um, sort of the low energy um, 
applies to atomic energy um, scale, effective field theory, gravity, so sort of linearized um, general relativity treated in a quantum field theoretic way. What Wallace calls uh, low energy quantum gravity. Yeah, my references are all like this, and uh, but there's a final page where you can see what all the references are. But if you think about quantum gravity as effective field theory, then there's even really novel predictions because in that sort of regime, in its, um, in its limit, there's a mean field uh, limit where we can treat the matter as, um, you know, we can treat, treat things as in a mean field way. Then there's the semi-classical sector, which I'm gonna talk about. And indeed, there are really tested new predictions that don't come just from general relativity. And okay, so in particular things like the theory of stellar evolution, really is a you know, deeply intertwined application of both general relativity and quantum phenomena. You know, we have to use Fermi pressure to explain why there are neutron stars and so on and so forth, whilst in the gravitational. So there really is even some novel predictions, and this is something he's stressed. Um, perhaps I'm forgetting the paper now. Um, I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago and somebody pointed out that it was actually an older paper in the physics literature that made much the, the same point, which I should put in there. And I, you can ask me later, I, I can look it up and tell you what it is. Um, okay. <clears throat> but one of the examples Wallace talks about in the sort of most extreme case, of course, you know, that's semi-classical gravity. So we're still sort of thinking of the gravitational field as in the equations as being, as being classical, as generated by quantum matter. There are even applications where we have to, you know, where it seems we have to think of uh, gravity itself as behaving in a quantum way. And so Wallace kind of talks about one of these, which is sort of a fairly standard account of the, the observed fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background in the early universe. Yet the explanation in the sort of standard inflation account um, involves superpositions of the geometry of gravity itself, and not just a mean field approximation. In fact, that's the kind of situation I'm gonna be talking about in the laboratory context. Um, I think what's nice uh, uh, you know, about the cases I'm going to talk about and are maybe more convincing and interesting is, well, they're a lot less theory laden than, than this kind of application. So sort of buy this and think this is really showing the quantum nature of gravity. You do have to buy in sort of standard inflation theory and not everybody does. So to that extent, there's sort of, you know, extra theoretical suppositions in that kind of example. All right. So, you know, what I'm talking about now is the kinds of ways in which one thinks about the empirical content of quantum gravity and what we can actually sort of access to sort of see where the experiments that I'm going to be thinking about, you know, fit into what's known. And so I'm going to be talking about something that should be, should be, we should be capable of doing in the laboratory to actually probe similarly the quantum nature of gravity. And of course, I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But a big part of the content of the talk. Okay, so what would actually it take to perform such an experiment? Well, one thing you might sort of think is, look, yeah, and the analogy with electromagnetism will be, I don't know, I won't bring it out terribly explicitly in what I'm saying, but you should have it in the back of your mind what goes to gravity really. It's very Electromagnetism is a good analogy as well, and these sort of things you would say about that case. All right, so how do we, you know, see the quantum nature of? Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> what do we mean when we say that we, you know, the observations, experiments that actually reveal the quantum nature of electromagnetism? Well, of course, the sort of most famous one and the one in high school the photoelectric effect before. But it's quite clear we're not going to do it, that it's going to be you know, really impossible to do a gravitational version of that. Right? I mean, if you, if you know, just think about the sort of scale of things, if you're thinking about the emission of a photon, you know, just think about hydrogen and the lowest energy gap, 
We're talking about energies that are like 10 GB per electron or volts. That's the sort of kind of energy the photon you're going to produce. But the gravitational potential energy is 10 to the minus 28 electron volts. So the amount of energy, gravitational energy between the different levels is so tiny, you're never going to see a particle of like this much energy. So that's really impractical. So another kind of way people have talked about and is a little more practical, but still really way beyond the sort of current technology is imagine you have some sort of massive super, um, massive system, some sort of superposition, and then happens with the gravitational field, but the gravitons get emitted, and so you can lose coherence from the superposition because of the mixed state. So that might be something you could you know think about uh, measuring. But again, if this is a very sort of hard, will be a very hard experiment to do. I mean, the experiments I haven't talked about are going to be very hard. This is a long way off in technology, maybe not unreachable, but uh, that's one way one might sort of see it. But the example I'm going to talk about involves uh, uh, the neologism. Uh, grab cats, gravitational Schrodinger cats. So, what I mean by this is a system that's small enough to maintain the quantum coherence, which is a quantum system, uh, but large enough that actually it has appreciable gravitational effects. So, you know, in the, over the last few decades, people have on the sort of this mass, right? People have been pushing for larger and larger objects um, to study quantum mechanics, or you know, that is quantum mechanically. And this way, you're measuring the gravitational effects of smaller and smaller things, larger and larger things. And maybe in the next 10 years, you know, they're going to actually meet up. And that's, you know, it just if you, but if you think about it, um, Sort of what again, sort of back of the envelope kind of uh, situation. Well, there's actually a regime where this should be possible, namely around the Planck mass. It should still be quantum mechanical, but gravitational as well. And happily, you know, that's 10 micrograms. This is the one sort of Planck scale, Planck quantity that's kind of human scale that actually you can get to. Um, the mass of a flea egg, or I read the other day, half a centimeter of hair, something like that. So that's the kind of experiment we're going to be talking about. Okay, um, so just to be sort of clear, I'm going to call these things grab cats, you know, whether or not they're actually in superposition, just because of the potential. I gave a talk the other day, and somebody, somebody was you know, fair enough said, do you mean just when they're in superposition that they're grab cats? Because we don't really have a Schrodinger cat until we have a superposition. But I mean it in a really kind of that broader sense, these kind of, um, this kind of object. Okay, I see one other note that I forgot to make, which is none of what I'm talking about here is going to sort of give you experiments that say separate string theory from loop quantum gravity or testing novel predictions of UV complete quantum gravity, anything like that. Those are not talking about fundamental. Um, all these theories, everything, that, yeah, all, all those sort of theories about how to have a you know, fundamental UV complete theory of quantum gravity are going to agree on everything I'm going to say here. So that's not, that's not the issue. <coughs> okay, good. So I guess I'll run through the outlines. There's two parts to the talk. One, I'm going to just explain the physics, and I'm not really adding any, I mean, just my explanation. This is not physics I've generated. I'm gonna give you the references to where this is coming from. I'm just gonna give you an introduction to the work people have been doing. So we'll come through, we'll come at the grab cats really sort of three times, three different ways of sort of thinking about what's going on. Um, and in some sense, which is the right way to think about them is the, is, is the big question that I'm talking about. Um, so we'll do a naive pass, first of all, where I just 
get the idea out on the table so you can see how it's going to work very quickly. That'll be enough for us to see that if the GrabCat experiment is done successfully and has the predicted outcome, then you can't model it um, using semi-classical gravity. So either out of the semi-classical regime, um, or if you kind of have in the back of your mind that really there is no quantum gravity, semi-classical gravity is kind of how things really are, that's going to actually be ruled out by these experiments. Then I'm going to come at two ways of really generating, you know, of, of modeling it. So the first I'll call the Newtonian, which go back to more um, fundamental physics, see how to derive things. Something's beeping at me. Uh, one way, we'll, then there'll be two models that we come out with, the Newtonian and the tripartite. And we'll see, these have lead to rather different interpretations of what's going on. And essentially at the heart of what I'm talking about is an argument about which is the right way to model it. And so which is the right way um, to describe the situation and to say, indeed, whether or not this is a quantum gravity effect. That comes to the fewer bullet points, but just one not new, the new value that I have here. I'm going to kind of look at those arguments, unpack them, and sort of talk about what one should say. Ultimately, I'm going to argue that what we really have here is some kind of paradigm choice, there is no, there isn't enough sort of shared theoretical assumptions to sort of settle this issue. So that's kind of the philosophical claim. And then I really get to this slide. And since I'm having to talk a little slowly because of my voice, I probably won't talk about this, but it's kind of a fun point as well to sort of think about why perform the experiment. Um, Partly, I think it's an interesting philosophical question. So I'll say it now, so you have, in case I don't get to say it later. All the theorists expect this experiment to be positive and to show, you know, to show the, the, the effect. No one dis, they don't disagree with that. But why? We don't usually do experiments where everybody knows what's going to happen. I think that's, so there's some kind of question here about what's going on. I think, yeah, okay. All right, so we'll jump into the um, into the physics. As I said, there's going to be three approaches. This is just a very naive approach. So, you know, you probably have questions about why this is all justified, but then we'll come back and sort of give a better justification. I just want to get on the table the, the basic idea here. So, oh yeah, well, but I can hide this, right? Is the right way to hide it? Okay. So, <laughs> uh, we host these meetings too. So. <laughs> All right. So, we have the, this is what I'm going to call the naive model, as I, you know, as I said. So, oh, but now, okay. So suppose we have a pair of these grab cats, um, and so you know one proposal was that you would use, where I said there, a hundredth of a microgram diamonds. I think the way the technology goes, you want something that's a little lighter than the front cats. Um, okay, that, that's what I'm thinking about, and that they start in a. So I've got two. Um, two grab cats, uh, one on the right, one on the left. And what you can imagine is each one is now in a superposition of um, right and left, and right and left as well. Okay, so I'll break that state down. Is that the location? Right to the yes, it's, it's really right and left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the yeah, idea well, it has to be, so it's not a bit of a bridge, but it has, it has to be different distances apart. That's usually the whole. Oh, trick. Okay, so you know you could. How could you do this? But imagine they had you know one. I don't know if this is it. If the experimentalists are kind of in awe of you know, how they figure out to do these things, but you know the sort of undergraduate kind of 
on relativistic quantum mechanics, which, uh, well, suppose they have spin and you see each one to a slowly realized operator. So things get very bad like that. Okay. Um, so that's the picture. So there wasn't a laser on here, right? No, that's not it. I meant for something. All right, so, all right, so some notation. So this is the initial state. Everything on the, so everything on the left of the tensor product refers to grad cat one. Everything on the right of the tensor product refers to grad cat two. I left indices off just to keep things kind of neater. Um, that's kind of how I prefer to do it. For each one's in a left-right superposition. They're sort of centered at a point plus or minus D from the origin. And then they have a displacement of delta either side of the, the central mass. Um, so this is the picture that we have, right? This this represents the left of grad cat one. This represents the right of grad cat one, and, and so on. All right. So but we can you know, practically multiply that out and get this state. So basically, we get four terms. One of which is you know a state where we have both grad cats in their left position. One in which Grab cat one's on the left and grab cat two's on the right, and so on. Um, and so, what we're going to treat each of those separately, and just the principle of linearity of the unitary evolution, just to think about what's going to happen here. Okay. So, but what you notice is when I have the two left ones, well, they're a distance uh, well, it's 2D apart. Okay. But if I have a left and a right, well, now they're a distance 2d plus 2 delta apart. They're further apart. Okay? So we're going to assume the experiment, they're not moving to start with, there's no kinetic energy. Um, they're not, the experiment's not going to run far long enough that they start moving. So this is all kinetic energy. So the Schrodinger, all we, we just apply ordinary Schrodinger equation, and then all we have to worry about is the gravitational potential energy. And so we're going to pick up on each of these terms a phase that depends on the, on the potential energy because it's different in each one. We're going to get a different phase and they're going to no longer be, it's no longer be, it's going to be a separable state. Okay, so we're going to get, as time goes on, this is what we expect the evolution to look like. As I said, the distance between the two left ones is a distance 2D, so I pick up a phase that has um, 2D in the, in the denominator of the, of the phase. And these ones, it's a different distance, 2D plus 2 delta. So I get a different phase. So these are just the Newtonian potentials that are put in by hand. So, okay. Uh, but obviously, as time goes on, these are not equal. And so we end up um, with a non-separable state. We can't factor this out anymore. The thing is entangled. Okay, it's observably entangled. Of course, that's one of the things you, it's going to have to be sort of resolved in the experimentally. But if yeah, you're still thinking of these things having spin and spin Dirac apparatus, you know, how would you do it? Well, you would now put them back, back through the stern Dirac apparatus the other way to get rid of the superpositions, and their spins would now be entangled. So you could measure the spin correlations and you'd be looking for violations of spin Dirac apparatus to see that it was quantum. So that's just sort of conceptually about how we're going to do that. Okay. These would all go back to their sort of zero position, but the spins would now, it wouldn't be factorizable when you put in the spin states. That would, that would be something you can measure. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, so. No. Feynman kind of had some similar idea uh, like back in the 50s about how this, that rings kind of thing. Uh, I'm forgetting what the kind of book I think was called. Uh, yeah, it's embarrassing. Uh, but I don't think anyone really kind of proposed this seriously up in the, until a very few years ago, where there's a paper with a whole with a long list of people that you see at the end, including Sajid Boza in 2017, and then um, Chiara Marletto and um, um, uh, Bedrao. I don't know how to spell the name, I guess. 
came up with this proposal sort of simultaneously and somewhat in somewhat different ways. And so they suggested you know, we should do this experiment and propose what well, the only way to interpret it is showing the quantum nature of gravity. Um, so another paper I will talk about later that's also argues this very strongly is by um, uh, Kristen Ladulu and Rebelli a couple of years later. And I'll tell you what that says um, in a minute. So these are people who are trying to you know, do the experiment. We've now seen the quantum nature of gravity, gravity behaving in a quantum way. Uh, I hope you're kind of a little sort of surprised by that claim at this point, because it seems kind of strong given the way I've set, set things up here, uh, which is why we're going to have to sort of go back into this and think about it even harder. Because, I mean, this is where gravity is showing up in these terms. And so really all I've done is sort of, I just suppose there's this gravitational potential. And well, I, you know, I put the hats on it because it's not very, so that's how quantum mechanics works. This doesn't really look very, um, very quantum. So really what's kind of, you know, what's really going on here? Um, and indeed, if this were all there were to the story, then there were experiments done back in the 70s, the cow experiment, um, neutron interferometry that measured sort of a similar result. Um, so it sort of would split the neutron beam um, so that it went sort of pass like this, and then this and recombine so that this one travels in sort of closer to the earth than this one. So there's a difference in the potential similarly that they're experiencing and then they observe the interference when they, when they recombined due to this effect. So that's an effect we've already seen, you know, for 40 years that involves this, this kind of effect. Crucially, of course, the difference is in this, in the cow experiment, the, it's the Earth that's the source of the gravitational field, which is not in a quantum superposition for the purposes of the experiment. Whereas in this, the sources are also in a superposition. I mean, that's the big difference. And the idea is, well, does that also mean that the gravitational field is in a superposition? Okay. Good, good. So that's kind of where we are. All right. Um, I hope that thought. Let's just think about, right. So if you kind of think, uh, you know, you do expect to sort of get this phenomenon. You know, you think you're going to get the entanglement. That is going to rule out semi-classic gravity. This is, I've explained it to you in a naive way. You've seen what that predicts, but think about what semi-classical gravity predicts. And it does not predict any entanglement. You won't see entanglement. So that's pretty crucial without even going any further. This would sort of would could not be explained in a semi-classical way. So let me explain that briefly. So you know that as I said, that's important to thinking. This is a, a regime we haven't probed yet, and it's important in case anyone sort of has the thought that maybe semi-classical gravity is sort of a full story. And you know, that was just a kind of you know, it's a sort of funny history as well. I, I'm not sure who really thinks that, but there's a whole history of people trying to show that that can't possibly be right. Uh, so people obviously kind of worry about it. Uh, and uh, if anyone's thinking of the Page and Galka experiment at this point, ask me later. I don't, I hope I don't have to explain it. Um, but that's worth bringing up as well. Okay, <clears throat> so well, let's think about what semi-classical gravity says, why it's not going to work. So uh, I'm going to take semi-classical gravity basically just to be defined by the semi-classical Einstein equation, einstein muller rosenfeld felt equation. You know, and of course, the basic point is um, that's a subscript, you know, the gravitational field is going to be determined by the expectation value of the, of the, of the 
press energy tends to grow from a material in that group here. Okay, so this is what you know, this is the way you would think about uh, um, coupling quantum matter to classical gravity. Okay, so but the basic upshot of this equation is there's just one gravitation for each of the terms we had before the left, right, the, the left. Left, 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 right, right, left, and right, right. They're all just sitting in the same gravitational field. There's, there's only the, the potential is just the same distribution in space. So what that actually means is every time I have a term for a grab, you know, grab cat one on the left, I get the same potential. It doesn't care where the one on the right is. And what that means is it's going to stay separable. So maybe this isn't like. I'll just show you this for a sort of very naive way of thinking it through. So there's just one potential. So I'm going to think grab cat one, the potential that it sees just depends on the expected position of grab cat two. But whenever I'm on the left, I'm 2d plus delta away from the expected position of grab cat two, namely in the middle. And it doesn't care whether grab cat two is sort of actually, you know, in the, in the term in the superposition, whether it's actually on the left or on the right. So every time I see a left grab cat one, I'm going to get this. Every time I see a right grab cat one, I'm going to see this, because all I care about is how far I am from the expected position, and you know, vice versa for grab cat two. But when you, you know, I write it out and you see it just because this term is the same as this term. It's all going to stay, it's all going to factorize. Indeed, I could have just written it as left, just kept it as left plus right, uh, left plus right cross right and left plus right, and then you would have seen it sort of automatically. So basically, it's just one classical field they're sitting in, whatever it is, and that's not going to produce a superposition. Okay, it factorizes. So do the experiment, find the expected entanglement. This is just wrong. You can't explain the entanglement. Okay. <clears throat> so that's at least one sense in which you might say, you know, the, the successful completion of this experiment is witnessing quantum gravity in the sense of taking out of any classical regime. But one might hope for more than that. One, I, and generally people do have something more than that in mind for witnessing the quantum nature of gravity. Um, in particular, cause, because almost no you know, quantum gravity theoreticians think this is sort of as a serious contender and it sort of just is gonna break down. So what's the big deal? But then you have the question of, is it really, I'm sure when the experiments, you know, when the experiments are done and the, you know, the newspapers report it, and hopefully one day, you know, Nobel Prizes are awarded. This is going to be part of what that people talk about and cite. But it's kind of funny because people don't, don't really prove this. Um, I mean, no, I might say the same about the aspect experiments as well. I, I really doubt anyone thought that they weren't a fundamental violation. But I think it's kind of an interesting question. No. By some exp yeah. good. good, good, good. Okay. Um, so well, let's go back and try to think more carefully about what's going on in these experiments. And you know, try to understand what it is they're showing, and you know about the quantum nature of gravity. So we'll go back to um, sort of more fundamental physics, um, and the place we would sort of start is quantum field theory and general relativity. So here I'm quoting from a paper um, by Anastopoulos and Hu, which you see it's a bit earlier, and actually they're talking about um, uh, Newton-Schrödinger equation. Other kinds of approaches to quantum, quantum gravity. Um, they, they do the derivation here. <clears throat> so, 
know, how would you approach things this way? Well, you start with a theory of general relativity with scalar matter in it, um, classical, the classical matter field. Okay. Linearize the theory in Minkowski space time to gauge theory, <laughs> as we well know. Um, so you have to fix the gauge, in a, when you fix the gauge in the usual way, um, you end up with the following Hamiltonian, and I can invite you to read their paper to see how this all goes. But, you know, this is the Hamiltonian you would, you get, and this is all very standard. This is not kind of massively new or contrary physics. It's just a standard approach to the theory. So, of course, you get the Hamiltonian for the matter field, so the Klein, the scalar matter, the Klein Gordian, Klein Gordian equation for matter. Then we get this term involving um, energy density, which obviously looks like the Newtonian potential. Of course, this in the theory comes from um, the, 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 the gauge constraint. This is the Gaussian gauge constraint. So this is a gauge term. That's how it shows up in this in this equation. Then we have higher order terms. So Tij is going to be the stress energy. And gamma, I, gamma IJ, these are metric per perturbations for the waves that are adding up. So I just heard this, this solution. So we have a term that, inter you know, that's an interaction term between the stress energy and the metric perturbations and the waves. We have a term you know, for uh, perturbation, inter self interaction of perturbations, and then higher order terms. Uh, this is an expansion, this is an approximation. Okay, very good. But The case we're looking at, well, nothing's moving. We don't care about the mass up here. So there's no way, there's no contribution to the Hamiltonian for that. These are all perturbative terms. They're too small to be to be relevant, at least at the kind of lead, leading order is what we actually expect to see um, at this stage. So all that actually kind of appears is this Gaussian term. So of course, when you quantize and blah, 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 this just is the Newtonian potential, right? as, as it kind of really should be. That, this is really just the justification for why it's actually okay to just write down the Newtonian potential in the Miller Heap model. If you start from first principles and take kind of take the limits in a standard way, that's exactly um, what you find. Yeah. And not surprisingly, some people would have gone to be wrong if you did, if you didn't. Okay, so by the Newtonian model, I mean something that's formally the same as the naive model, except you're now understanding it in this context. This is the model, you know, mathematically it's the same as the naive model, but you're understanding it as coming from applying quantum field theory to general relativity in a standard way. Okay. So Aristotelis and who, and people who are skeptical about whether we're seeing the quantum nature of gravity, point to this kind of kind of derivation, not in that paper, but in, paper, in later papers and commentaries. They say, well, this Newtonian potential, this is just a gauge constraint term, this is just from the Gaussian constraint. It's fully determined by the instantaneous matter distribution. It doesn't involve any of the gammas, which from a gauge point of view are what one calls the true degrees of freedom, the physical ones, the ones that actually have some dynamics. And so there's no real physics here, so this really couldn't be, we couldn't be seeing quantum gravity here. All the quantum gravity is in this stuff, and so this isn't quantum gravity. So that's sort of bringing a the gauge theoretic thinking to bear, you know, to bear to try to back up the sort of naive you know, the worries we had about the naive model. Um, you know, in some sense, you know, the perturbations when you quantize become gravitons. So what it is they want to see is like individual gravitons. Creation and annihilation of gravitons. So something closer to the photoelectric effect. Okay. Um, Yes. Um, so, okay, some kind of paper that argues this is Anastopolis and a couple of others. 
total weight of the stuff. Okay, so that's the Newtonian model. So I'll pay attention, like at the moment, I'm just not taking votes on this bit. People are kind of moved one way or the other. Because if you say this, was anyone sympathetic to this line of reasoning? Don't have to vote, you don't have to have an opinion, but quite often people have quite strong opinions on either side, and that's kind of fun when they do. <clears throat> but look, one thing you might sort of be thinking at this point is, but look, this is pretty seriously wrong in a, in a, in a, in a well-known way. Where did this, uh, this is that it's determined by the instantaneous matter distribution. This is not causal. I mean, we're really, this is general relativity we're talking about. We need to have a model that really respects that, that gravity is not just an action at a distance force. It's itself a dynamical system. It's causal. Okay. And that's, this model is just kind of loses track of that. So if we really want to think about this properly, we need to keep that in mind as well. Okay. So we just lost this important lesson. I don't mean that we knew the le this lesson 200 years ago, but we started learning it 200 years ago. So, yeah. I'm thinking you know, about Faraday and Maxwell and hundred years ago we learned this lesson, but 200 years, it's, yeah, it's a long time to learn it. That's kind of totally lost in this model and that needs to be taken into account. Okay. So I've got a kind of naive version of this. Uh, well, I say it's naive, but for Marletto and um, Vedrao really is, was thinking exactly this way. Um, and I'll talk about the Crystal Adulu and Rebelli paper as well, um, which basically is thinking this way. So, um, Okay, so if gravity really is itself dynamic and causal, then it itself is a, a third system. There aren't really two, just two systems in here interacting by a, a Newtonian potential. There are three systems. We ought to build gravity in as well. So when we write our initial state, when we have well, grab pads on the left, we should also write in the appropriate state for the gravitational field. When we have one on the left and one on the right, we write in a different gravity state for the gravitational field. So it's tripartite. There really are three systems, not two. And really, what's crucial is in all these models is there's no direct interaction at all. If you write, you have to think about this with the Hamiltonian, there's no interaction terms that directly couple the two grab pads. All that can happen is grab pad one can interact with the gravitational field. And the gravity of gravity pad two can interact with the gravitational field. That's kind of the key so assumption. There's nothing, there's no direct interaction, which of course is what you want. You know, these things are separated spatially. Effects have to propagate, so there has to be this third system to make them interact. Okay. Um, this kind of got people, part of, one of the reasons this got people excited was from and, and why started thinking about this, but this brings us into a branch of quantum information theory. Um, there is local operations, classical connections, LOCC um, theory, because that's sort of what we're talking about here. Um, that depends whether this is classical or quantum. Okay, so there are you can see kind of results bounding on what can actually be done with a system where this intermediary is classical rather than quantum. Kind of the connection that's being made here. So, all right, for instance, and now this is the crystal of Lulu and um, Rebelli. What could that get? What could those gammas be? The natural, you know, uh, kind of like really nice picture to sort of think about is well, they just represent different classical states of, of, of space time geometry. So, we're in the Newtonian regime, so what, you know, what metric should these be kind of representing? Well, it's just going to be the Newtonian limits of general relativity, 
Um, and this is the metric, and the, the, you know, pi one is the, just the Newtonian potential for, for grab cat one, pi two is the Newtonian potential for grab cat two. So that's standard Newtonian limits for gender relativity. Okay, that would be, uh, but anyway, that, that's what, you know, that's where you take your potential. Oh, <coughs> Uh, I should say, you know, R is the coordinate from the center of the grab cat little r. Big R is the radius of the grab cat. So basically just saying it's constant potentially inside uh, each grab cat. Okay. Okay, it made me think about things in a different way. So they're not exactly modeling these, you know, uh, in the way I was sort of suggesting as something kind of mediating, you're just mental. So supposing each of these is a geometry, so the pair of grab cats is now moving through the gravitational field appropriate to their configuration. They're sitting in different metrics and different gravitational fields. And so you know, they, they start, they split, they go through, they recombine. There's going to be redshift effects. It's not going to be the same plot of time along all these paths. And so now we're going to um, get different, they're going to take different times in each of these before they come back because of a different gravitational field. Um, there's going to be now a phase due to the mass energy. That's the little plot that's working here. And so the, it's not different energies, it's different times now. They all have the same energy, but they take different times for the, the different branches. Okay, and surprise, surprise, you get the same result if you think about things that way instead. Um, I mean, so that's really nice. You can think about it that way. You know, not super surprise. I mean, it should really work come out, work out that way. You'd again think it was for some serious problem if it didn't. And of course, these phase factors are kind of the simplest things you could possibly write down that actually is, you know, have the right units given the quantities involved. So it's not, in many ways, not a huge surprise that this works out, but they, you know, they did this. Right, if you think about things this way, why do we get, you know, you know what's the explanation of the um, entanglement that we get? Well, the intermediate state is like this. The gravitational field is obviously in a superposition here. This is quantum gravity. I literally have a superposition in the Chris classical geometry, a quantum superposition, not a GR superposition. So, you know, what could be more kind of quantum as that? So, okay, I've already basically just talked about causality. This was one thing we and most really Mike did in a paper was you. you Causality is not really relevant in, I mean, kind of light cone type, you know, light speed causality is not what's really crucial here. It's the thing that I said, there's no direct interaction between the grab cats. So of course you can do it for Newton and Hartman in a way as well and get the same, same sort of result. Um, so we did that. <clears throat> I should mention in the Berza paper, they didn't do it this way. They talk, they did it in a more quantum theory kind of way thinking about coherent states of the graviton field, you get the same, you get the same result. But you know, this one's quite dramatic, and it's kind of nice. Okay. So as I said, you know, what really matters is that gravity is the interaction mediating subsystem. There's no direct interaction. And then, as I said, it, it's kind of a pretty immediate consequence of quantum mechanics that systems can't really just be classical. You won't get entanglement if that's all that's going on. So there's a sort of naive proof we did in the paper. There's sort of deeper proof, proofs. Uh, Maletto and Vedrao, uh, they, give, they give a sort of quantum mechanical proof that it seems to make a bit of a jump to me. Um, in later work, they use David Deutsch constructor theory. This is one of his new things, which kind of proves the same thing. It's a kind of extension of the like, generalization of quantum mechanics kind of idea. Uh, uh, you know, Flaminia Giacomini and some of her collaborators. Uh, I, 
Hotel. Steige. Ja, Steige. Wie lange ist das Buch da? Wann ist das von der Post auf das da? Kommt es nur von die Werbung und so. Yeah. Uh, so this paper is um, generalized probability theories approach. So again, this is a, the way of generalizing quantum mechanics that you have probability distributions that are non-classical that can be sort of more general than the ones you're sort of talking about. Quantum mechanics, same sort of thing. If you if you get entanglement, the system that's doing the mediating can't be classical. So it's a pretty strong result. Okay, um, and so. You know, from that point of view, if you win this, the entanglement um, can't explain it with classical gravity. Okay, very good. Um, is that already 50 minutes or just sort of 45? Um, go ahead, don't worry. Um, I, I, I think that's the last one. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry about that. It's just, this is a good part, it's really nice. I mean, I think, you know, we've sort of been setting up the, the conceptual issues along the way. So, I, I, you know, you can sort of see where this is going to go. So I may not go through the whole thing, you know, really, but let's uh, I'll start to make a few, a few kind of points here. Then maybe we should talk. Okay, so maybe the review is not going to be so... I'm going to get rid of this again. All right, so just to sort of recap, okay, from the Newtonian model, we throw away all the interesting terms, so we're just left with this kind of Newtonian potential, and what's so quantum about that? Um, on the other hand, we have the tripartite model or other models, and there's different ways of doing it. Um, yeah, of course, we must be you know, observing quantum, the quantum nature of gravity, because if it wasn't quantum, we wouldn't kind of get any effects. Okay, so which is the correct way to model the experiment? Let me ask you again, is anybody tempted one way or the other? Go strong with one way or the other? Avro, you seem to be nodding more along to the causal model. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, it's not anybody else kind of feeling I, I think they're both equivalent, but continue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm Good, good. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no, some, 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 no, there's a talk, I guess, a talk in Pittsburgh, and John Dalton was like, no way, this is not, there's no quantum here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he talked to Rodelli, and he's like, ah, that's crazy, it's causal, and they're throwing everything away. And, People have very strong kind of opinions, and it's especially nice if there's an audience with the whole kind of split. But I want to say it's, it's you know, the paradigm choice here is the split is kind of evidence for my thesis sometimes here. Um, all right, and, you know, I usually also have to say, and of course, to make that case, I'm going to always have to argue against whatever it is you think is the case. So I'm not on the other side. So put it to, you know, argue with everybody. Okay, um, so let's see what I was what I was saying here. Uh, you know, I asked the question of which is the correct way to model the experiment. I won't give a big surprise at this point. I don't think that's really the kind of question, a good question, or a question I really had a kind of answer. This is not the kind of thing about which they can really do you know, unequivocal correctness or, or wrongness. So just think about the situation. Everybody here, I mean, it's not totally clear what everybody thinks, but you can kind of imagine all the interlocutors here agree on the fundamental physics, general relativity, the quantum field theory, you can apply quantum field theory to linear gravity, vector field theory. That's all good stuff. That's that's just how this thing things are. 
they all agree on that. There's no disagreement on that level. What they're really disagreeing on is how to um, extract an approximate, you know, a model from that in the Newtonian regime. You know, how to do that approximation, how to take the limit. And they're ending up in different places because of you know, making decisions about that. Moreover, I've tried to present both of these in a very much positive way. I don't, there's nothing kind of unreasonable about either of the three patterns of reasoning here. Effectively, it's very quantum parity, yeah, that's good. And yeah, but Giard's causal as well, that's good. These seem to be reasonable things to, you know, to emphasize. So maybe there's just a problem here. It's not like they, they can really settle this. Maybe the thing's just theory late. So what we do a lot in the paper is actually to try to tease out more, you know, what the different theoretical perspectives are. So obviously to some extent I've been doing that sort of through the talk. I just want to make a few kind of extra comments about um, you know what assumptions are being made, the risk of getting myself in trouble, you know, what different values are the different communities taking, and I mean that in the sort of Kuhn objectivity value theory and judgment paper, you know, things that can't be sort of settled more or less algorithmically by the evidence and a sense of values. So I think that is what's kind of happening here. Um, so yeah, that's what we're going to just do for a couple of slides. And I won't go over the hour. I'm not even sure it could. So I do apologize for talking too long. But I think I'll go through these fairly, sort of fairly quickly. So one way this was sort of put in the early days, the sort of early iterations of the debate was to make the point of the argument from the point of view of the Newtonian model, you needed more than just sort of standard gauge theoretic quantization. You really had to buy into standard law or interpretational ideas about quantum about gauge theory. Um, and I think that was a, you know sort of a mistake that occurred there. You know. So this was two things I sort of noted before. Okay, the explanation in the Newtonian model totally ignores which theoretic true degrees of freedom and actual physical ones. The first is because these are all in the perturbations and they're just not relevant. Um, instead, it's all due to the Newtonian potential, you know, which is just a gauge constraint term. And so there's a sort of argument that I think we sort of did see in the literature or they kind of, there were some papers that circulated and they never ended up in the archive or they came out of the archive. So some of this is kind of interesting. Um, but I think the part he's suggesting that, uh, um, well, and it's not using any true gravitational degrees of freedom, then this really can't be showing anything about gravity at all. But I think that's just, an, we think, you know, that's an equivocation on the word sort of true. True is used in a technical sense here, and it doesn't mean sort of real in the more general kind of um, sense. Okay, and that's kind of obvious. So exactly how you split things up, you know, how things look, is that it looks, you've got the, the Newtonian term is somewhat dependent on the actual gauge that you pick. And it's also kind of nuts to say the Newtonian potential somehow isn't physically, if that's what you mean by saying it's not true, if you mean it's not physically real, that's what we were talking about kind of last night, that's a really weird thing to say, right, because, you know, Different distributions of matter produce different potentials, and different potentials produce different effects. And indeed, this is the whole of Newtonian gravity. So, if you don't think that's, you know, physically real, then you don't think. You know, if we really push this, you're saying Newtonian gravity isn't physics somehow. You know, it's that's not really a physically real thing. Uh, maybe you do want to say that if you're arguing against the structuralist, the structural realist, maybe. But it seems like a pretty hard thing to say and would need some kind of justification. Right, so, you know, this is why we call 
things where there's potential gravity and it'll g r, even though it doesn't involve the true degrees of freedom. So one shouldn't like read too much into into sort of the term true here. Uh, I think that's pretty clear in the debate now. Um, I think there was some sort of confusion. I don't, I don't exactly know what was, that was, that was part of what was straightened out. Um, exactly what the people on the work in the Newtonian model were thinking. You know, whether the, how seriously they took this, I'm not sure. But they said some things that made them seem like they were doing something along these lines. But that can't be a reason for sort of really thinking about it. On the other hand, the analysis, the formal analysis seems right. I mean, at least then the theoretical assumptions that go into it seem right. And of course, the upshot is that you just end up with this, this gauge term, and that's the whole of gravity. And what's, what is, what's so, there doesn't seem to be anything super quantum about this. And as I said in particular, if you are satisfied with that alone, we already have uh, this done in the 70s. Okay. This, this one, this will be the last one. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have the tripartite model, which takes gravity to be an intermediary. So some people might kind of exist accepting that as a way of modeling the system. So I said the quantum gravity theorists have almost all I think, take the sort of real effective field theory approach to general relativity to be a valid approach because this is good physics. And so would that, that would lead them to accept the tripartite paradigm. Um, but other people might be neutral. Um, Mike especially has emphasized this point I think it's interesting to think about what experimentalists would kind of think. I think experimentalists, and part of the discussion is you know, what experimentalists do is, you know, as many people have kind of argued over the years, is somewhat independent, and in large ways independent of what the theorists do. And you still have some, you know, you know people like Ian Hacking, right? About uh, things they want to experiment with what happens in experiment. Um, there are people who have sort of other views about how to combine quantum mechanics with gravity, um, while still having gravity quantum in some sense, and not thinking about sort of Penrose or semi-classical kind of pictures. But there may be some other mechanism where actually you don't think this is going to be a good description. But as I say, amongst the quantum gravity theorists, um, the assumptions that go into this model are generally accepted. I think this discussion came out of a long sort of argument we had or we met with um, Ravelli and argued with him about this for a while. And then one of the things that sort of the discussion clarified uh, for me when we were talking with him, look, if you believe that the DFT picture is GR, then you're going to be committed uh, to whatever the necessary assumptions of the kind of no-go theorems that I was saying before, of LOCC, quantum mechanics just requires the system to be an intermediary, right? So in some sense, you're going to, if you see the entanglement and you sort of are committed to the standard picture, you're gonna to have to conclude that really what's happening here is a quantum affair, okay? And what you're really debating is, well, do we really need to go down to, you know, perhaps if we look at what's happening in a really most, you know, in a more fundamental story, well, we don't need to. I, I can tell, you know, if, if, you, if you believe that gravity is quantum, then, you know, when I, I don't want to drop some, okay, but the, you know, the fact that I, the gravitational field is keeping me attached to the floor, that's a quantum effect, there's, there's that, right? Um, so that's not really what's the issue is what the, how things are sort of fundamentally. It's whether this is enough of a quantum effect to really count as having seen the quantum nature of gravity. You know, obviously the experiment's more convincing than just my slam not, not flying, you know, floating off, but still it's not really where we want to set the bar. You know, if we want the photoelectric effect or something. Okay, so as I say. You could have all those kind of commitments and really be forced to think, yeah, sure, you know, really that's what's going on. But 
but still the Newtonian model is the right way to describe this experiment and so this can't be counted properly according to physics. Okay. Um, and there's sort of a principle one might sort of back that up with. You know, I've got these two models and they're sort of they're empirically equivalent. I might you know, the sort of intuition here is I am right. I should prefer the sort of the simpler model. It's better to kind of ignore as much of the fundamental stuff as possible. Just as I don't care about all the I don't kind of use general relativity to understand why I'm stuck on the floor and you know. Ignore as much extraneous stuff as possible. And it seems that does take you to the Newtonian model rather than to the um, tripartite model. Okay, and then we come back to some sort of comments about the gauging. And so, you know, what we would really like is something where we actually do see an effect of creation and annihilation of gravity properties, you know, individually, or something not the photoelectric effect, but something more like experiment. Um, and this gives me a chance to cite this nice paper by um, Valenkia and several other people, including Borg, um, several of which we'll kind of look at. And it's, uh, it's very nice, uh, which I would say has it sort of bears on these issues in complicated ways, but sort of most relevantly has to do with some sort of an effect that has to do with decoherent streams. So, all right, I think that this means I'm going to stop now. Uh, this does mean I didn't get to the slides that I uh, might not get to, but I think that was at least an hour, so I should shut up. And Here. Mm -hmm. Here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, these gamma r l and gamma r r terms and so forth are giving you different metric fields, right? Oh, the, this sorry, this yeah, yeah, yeah. And but the <laughs> r and l capital r. And How does the fact that you've got in each term you've got a different space-time geometry affect the way you think about the other part of the, the other part of these um, species? Um, Good. So, all right. So, I mean, I think what so this is, as I said, is coming from the Christopher Dooley <coughs> and Ravelli paper. So I think what they're keeping fixed essentially is you know, the distance we're taking over from the standard case, just how far apart these are from one another. So, yeah, they're not moving. So they kind of take an estimate, I think, the way you would in a normal sort of uh, Newtonian limit in general relativity with a sort of the preferred frame in which they're just sort of sitting there. So the idea, like, yeah, again, that's another sort of approximation. Like, there was the, you know, built in here as well. When I crossed this off, there's no kinetic energy. It's, they're heavy enough that the, the fields are weak enough that the 
you know, the effect on the phases is much greater than any effect on the motion. So they really don't do that. Kind of aren't moving at all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're doing the actual experiment, that effect has to be you know, calculated to make sure it really is, you know, it's more than half an inch tall. Is there some reason that, because that thing needs to go into the carriage, and the new platform is there, that is acceptable in the reality. So the new cost that is. Proper time on the trajectory that's giving it. So the question is, you know, matching up the points, right? If they're just sort of sitting there doing kind of this, how are you supposed to match things up? You know, the idea is you match up before they split. You know, when they really are all about the same positions, that would be a way then you could identify across the different terms. I mean, I guess all you, uh, maybe you've been to do that. You, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that's the sort of thought, yeah. Are there other questions? Valdo? Farhan? Uh, is it related to what the gentleman said? Oh, okay. So I'll go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, very good. And that's kind of so that's another way that I didn't put up here that I mean, people can ask afterwards and who sort of argue. Look, I, if I can do the, if I can analyze this, do just the exact analogy, analogous case for electromagnetism and seeing this entanglement, no one's going to think, you know, no, one, no one ever thought that was showing the quantum nature of electromagnetism. Ah, yeah, yeah, well, that's, okay, that's what they say, and then, but then the response is, well, actually, yeah, we should have thought that all along, is what the response would be. So, so I don't totally understand. So this is something I don't totally understand. Um, but, you know, again, Ravelli talked about this. Um, if I understand what he's telling me right, is no one's really done that experiment in electromagnetism, surprisingly enough. Um, people are actually going to try and do that. You know, it seems like a natural thing to sort of try to, you know, as a preparation for this, that actually this is going to be something that's done. Uh, I mean, I can sort of believe nobody sat down and, and tried to do this explicitly, although it seems like a nice experiment that someone should have done at some point. You know, I mean, I guess you know, but maybe it's the same as for the, you know, everyone knows what's going to happen. So in some sense, what's the, what's the point? Um, but the thing I find a little bit funny is um, I would have thought in quantum computing, avoiding that kind of entanglement would be really important, right? Because you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, this is a loss of coherence for one of the systems. So I, I'm kind of a bit confused that it's not something that you just sort of see routinely and actually have to go out of your way to, to screen off. But I, I'm not quite sure about that. But yeah, yeah, so the, they, they, yeah, there's not much that's different between the gravitational and electromagnetic field system. So, if you have uh, the different electromagnetism, 
And the people do experiments. They put the eye on it next to each other. Um, one of the contributions was two positions. But two ions, so they have a spin, which is precisely. Mm -hmm. And then the coulomb interaction of these bits and the angle is spinning. Pretty clever problem for people to work out. But that doesn't really hold uh, with electromagnetism in quantum. And we can see the reverse of the classic is when it says that electro classic electromagnetism is mediated to quantum if the spin is equal to it. That's what it says. I don't think you can be able to do for the same reasons. I don't think you can be able to do it semi-classic with at least in some or semi-classic operators with the electron. So they'll be the same real energy entanglement once you. So I mean, you could make you could do it as a you know a Coulomb potential. Yes. That's not the same as doing you know, but you, but it's not the same as doing it in a semi-classical way because the Coulomb potential is different in each of the terms. I'm thinking of semi classical in analogy with the semi classical Einstein equation. So there would just be a single electric potential that they were all sitting in. But then you, that's exactly the point I showed for the gravitational. You don't get any entanglement in that case. So if each of those four terms had a different Coulomb potential. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in a, I mean, in the way I've been using it here. <coughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Good. 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 For the spin. Uh, so actually, that's kind of helpful. So maybe in a quantum computer, some charity. Because there, there it'll be spin rather than addition, superposition. It will be spin, and uh, but yeah, you, yeah. you can spin it over the quantum Sure. But you could do it the other way as well, right? That's a tripartite way, and you put in the, you know, you would have, you would do the same thing. You'd have a quantum superposition with classical electric fields. True. And then the people on the other side would say, yeah, no, no, that's showing the quantum nature of gravity. But the electromagnetic field is not this way. So good, I know, but that's really helpful. But yeah, exactly. The, the same argument goes through in the electromagnetic case, um, but I think I'm kind of detecting the different kind of intuitions about what to sort of say. On the one hand, well, we don't say that's quantum in the electromagnetic case. On the other hand, oh, we should have said it was quantum in the electromagnetic case. And I, I say again, I think these are both valid <laughs> ways of looking at it. In fact, and it's, it's not like you can really come down and say. Or find some sort of shared principle where everyone will say, oh, yeah, it's that way, not that way. It's actually revealed the kind of different, you know, values in that way. So uh, there is a question from uh, Ali. Uh, so please, Ali. Uh, Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. All right. Uh, hi, Nick. I Sorry, I came a little late, so I probably missed a lot, but I was intrigued by your last slide. You mentioned that gravity is a gauge constraint and not dynamical. Does this contradict like canonical approaches like geometrodynamics, like the Wheeler Druid equation, where gravity is a dynamical uh, object? I was just curious. So, um, yeah, you did miss the kind of key move here. So can, maybe you can put the same slide that Carl was asking about. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is sort of not, you know, yes in this model, but no kind of fundamentally. Are you still there? Yes, I am. So what I did a bit, you know, what, what you what I did a bit earlier was put if you see the Hamiltonian that's on the screen. Mm -hmm. So the idea from this was, I mean, you do you start from general relativity um, and quantum field theory, and you go ahead and, and try to quant and, and quantize um, linear gravity in a sort of standard way. So you gauge fix, okay? Um, and, you know, you've linearized, so you get this Hamiltonian out. 
So this is not a kind of geometrodynamics picture, but it's totally, you know, what I'm thinking of the things in a dynamical way, you know, but from this sort of effective field theory approach to general relativity. And it's just, now I think about, so I've written down my Hamiltonian, which is the whole thing without the X's, but I'm in this Newtonian regime uh, and everything is sitting still for the duration of the experiment. So the only term that's actually gonna contribute to the effect is the Gaussian constraint. And you know, from a gauge theoretic point of view, that's not dynamical. It doesn't involve any of the, you know, the gammas, which, is the, uh, you know, which are the perturbations, the dynamical part of the field. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. It's a different approach, certainly, but yeah. I get your point, yes. But fundamentally, yeah, everything's dynamical. It's not a weird view of gravity. It's just, you know, when you take the limit, well, you lose all the bit that it's all the pieces that look dynamical from a gauge theory point of view. Yeah. All right, thanks. That's what I mean. Thank you. Okay. So are there other questions uh, from uh, the people attending the Zoom? No? Oh, yeah. Paul? Do you have questions? Yeah. Um, with all these QG approaches, all, can you change the bases in the quantum formalism? Or does it have to be position bases? Uh, can you say a bit more about what you what you have in mind? Well, you can go from, in regular quantum mechanics, you can go from position to momentum or, or energy or something in between, whatever. Um, is that possible to do in these theories? Um, so I wouldn't, as I say, I wouldn't call these theories. So, um, Let's see. I mean, to go back to the same example I was talking about um, again, uh, yeah, so you're thinking about how does it look if, if you just change around the basis? Yeah. Um, so you're trying to imagine doing this experiment with a yeah okay with a sort of super with the the grand cats in a superposition of different momentum states rather than position states. Yeah, for example. So, so you mean for them rather than, okay, so position for that, um, then, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what things look like, but there's nothing, I think, I don't see why that's not, you know, that's not possible. Um, you know, again, these aren't, these aren't theories, that it would depend, I guess it would depend exactly what you wanted to do, how this would go. I mean, this is proposing a particular experiment. Okay, so here's one sort of answer, but I don't think this is quite what you're talking about. I mean, this, so this is considering a particular experiment where you, know, you actually are gonna put these things into a spatial superposition, and we're wondering what happens from that point of view. Okay, I mean, of course, you could expand in whatever basis you want. It's just quantum mechanics. Um, but there doesn't seem to be, I don't, it's all, you know, that would be equivalent. But I don't think there's any advantage to, to doing that. Maybe you're, you might, on the other hand, be thinking of a sort of different experiment where they were sort of put into a position, momentum superposition. Uh, yeah, I mean, I assume they'd be, you know, they'd have different energies then, right? They'd have different kinetic energies. So presumably there would again be an effect. Right, okay. 
But as I said, then, then the effect is going to come from the different kinetic energies. And the point here is the only thing that's contributing to the, the different potentials that give the different, um, that produce the different phase, phases is the gravitational interaction. And so on. I don't really want there to be different kinetic energies. So I'm not quite sure which way you were asking it. You know, again, it's quantum mechanics, so you could expand in whatever basis you wanted. Um, but in terms of the experiment, you do want it so that gravity is the, the effect you're probing. But I guess that you answer in a sense the uh, constraint and explains why they decided to use these phases rather than another. Yeah. Again, do you want you want yeah. We, we just want the gravity. So, in a sense, uh, it depends also on the <coughs> aims uh, related ah, to good, the experiment. So yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd measure some other kind of entanglement effect so if there was a momentum. I don't know whether this answer to your question, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? No? From here? Okay, Alvaro. <laughs> no, he's examining you. Yeah, I think that's what, sorry, I don't remember quite how it goes technically. It's pretty stable under different choices of gauge, but there are gauges that I think we need to take out. You know, we can, it's not all Coulomb and we have to include some of the interaction parts as well. I'm pretty, but not completely sure that even in electric input cases, there are ways to do it. So it's not all too modeled with that. Um, they're not normal ways. It's again, I'm unprepared to show me that I'm wrong about that, but I'm, I, I'm sorry, it's still worth it. Uh, yeah, if you can fix me on that, that would be great, but I think that's all right. Other questions? Yes, sir. So coming back to the, the um, Newtonian versus tripartite uh, way of modeling this, um, you know, the complaint that the, the Newtonian way is, is, is that um, calculate constraints so that no I just this might get off more point so I will I'm not so 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 <clears throat> I my view is that that's using a tendent it's a, a tendentious or at least a word politics because um <clears throat> so I guess well with Antonio Rosado I have a paper kind of arguing that it's the um I think I'm sympathetic to your to your view here. The way I, you know, I, I was a little ambiguous in the way, sort of in what I said, but I didn't kind of highlight it clearly enough. Because um, I started from talking about what well, we need fields. This is a field. It's a dynamical system, right? And so it's causal in 
general relativity, right? That's kind of an issue. You know about right, yeah. kind of does come in with the idea of causal structure. But I agree. I want to separate those those things down. Uh, you know, here it gets confused because you know, the object you know, the objection you sort of hear right is in the in the Newtonian model. Yeah. Say causal is sort of action at a distance, and that's sort of the problem. Let's, that, you know, that's not really the problem. It's that it's a field and it's dynamical and it should be tripartite. Um, and in particular, the thing I did sort of try to emphasize, which was my sort of antidote to the kind of concern that you have, it's quite specific. What I mean by sort of causal here really is there's no term in that, there's no interaction in terms between directly between the the grab cats. Mm -hmm. The only interaction between the grab cats here and the, and the field. I think, and that's what's crucial. And of course, that's what the Newton Cartan example is supposed to emphasize as, as well. So that doesn't care about the, you know, kind of instantaneous action. There's no problem with that. It's just the things don't interact with each other, they only interact with the, the gravitational field. So, yeah, no, I totally agree. And maybe there's other notions of causal as well that go you know, more than even what I'm saying here, but that's the one that's relevant for bringing all these quantum considerations. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, oh, I just wanted to see. Um, blah, 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 seems like this. Oh, I put in another slide over here. Slide. Okay, so there's this stuff about how to, why to do the experiment, um, which I've kind of alluded to. Bruno Latour died yesterday, just recently. I'm not sure everybody heard that. Uh, I'm not exactly, we're not exactly appealing to Bruno Latour, you know, as I said, Ian Hacking is about as far down that road as we would like to go. But, you know, I, I thought I would mention that. That as well. So, you know, I would say about the experimental stuff would be she was really good. She was really good. I think why people are excited about this, you can't really fully get at the precise thing about it in a sort of confirmation kind of way, or even sort of future confirmation or testing kind of way. What's really important is the action. This is a new regime, it's really not all pro. That's what, that's what physics does. It's not all about testing the theory. It's actually about being in the lab and actually being able to control, get control over situations. And indeed, I'm sort of okay about, you know, have some thoughts about advancing uh, things not really existing in reality. And, you know, in general, we kind of simplify the world in an experiment and actually make the thing concrete. And I think that's not a bad way of thinking about it. And there's nothing wrong with it. And it's, you know, that's, that has been a big motivation to do this experiment. It really is a new kind of thing we're going to make in the lab. Yeah. 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 So, um, I think one more would be interesting. Yeah, it will be interesting to have the reference of the screen. Um, so, there are people living uh, in time, and uh, also, thank you, thanking you. Um, are there other comments or questions for Nick? No, okay, so thank you very much. Sorry.